This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 15, for broadcast on the 24th of February, 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, organic material discovered on the dwarf planet Ceres, NASA's Europa flyby mission moves into design phase, and working out how to stop once you reach Alpha Centauri. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Evidence for organic material has been found on the dwarf planet Ceres. A report in the journal Science claims that detection by NASA's Dawn spacecraft adds to a growing list of solar system bodies found to contain organic materials, which are key building blocks for life as we know it. The dwarf planet Ceres is the largest body in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Organic compounds have already been found on several meteorites, as well as inferred from telescopic observations of numerous asteroids. The Dwarf Planet Ceres shares many commonalities with meteorites rich in water and organics, in particular a meteorite group known as carbonaceous chondrites. This discovery therefore further strengthens the connection between Ceres, these meteorites and their parent bodies. The study's lead author, Maria Cristina de Sanchez, from the National Institute of Astrophysics in Rome, says it's the first clear detection of organic molecules from orbit on any main belt asteroid. The data supports the idea that organic materials may be native to Ceres. The carbonates and clays previously identified on Ceres provide strong evidence for chemical activity in the presence of water and heat. This therefore raises the possibility that the organics were also processed in a warm water-rich environment. What it all means is that the organics discovery adds to Ceres attributes associated with ingredients and conditions for life in the distant past. Previous studies found hydrated minerals, carbonates, water ice and ammoniatic clays that must have been altered by water. Salts and sodium carbonates, such as those found in those creepy bright areas on Okatar Crater on Ceres, are also thought to have been carried to the surface by liquid. Dawn Project scientist Julie castillo Rogers from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the discovery adds to science's understanding of the possible origins of water and organics on Earth. Dawn was able to detect and map the locations of this material because of its special signature in near-infrared light. The organic materials on Ceres are mainly located in an area covering about a thousand square kilometres. The signature for organics was very clear on the floor of Immutet Crater on its southern rim and in an area just outside the crater to the southwest. Signatures were also detected across the northwest part of the crater rim and ejector, while other small organic-rich areas were also spotted several kilometres to both the west and the east. Organics were also detected in a very small area in the Inhamari crater about 400 kilometres away. In enhanced visible colour images from Dawn's framing camera, the organic material is associated in areas that appear redder with respect to the rest of Ceres. The distinct nature of these regions stands out even in low-resolution images taken by the visible and infrared mapping spectrometer. The authors are still working to try and understand the geological context for these materials. Having completed nearly two years of observations in orbit around Ceres, the Dawn spacecraft has been in a highly elliptical orbit, ranging from an altitude of 7,520 kilometres up to almost 9,350 kilometres. The spacecraft's now moving to a new 20,000 kilometre high orbit on a different orbital plane in order to study the 965 kilometre wide dwarf planet in a new geometry. This will allow Dawn to view Ceres with the sun directly behind the spacecraft, allowing the dwarf planet to appear brighter than before, perhaps in the process revealing more clues about its nature. Launched back in September 2007 on a Delta II rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida, NASA's Dawn mission first took the 1.2-ton probe to the main belt asteroid Vesta. Dawn entered Vesta orbit in July 2011, undertaking a 14-month study of the 572-kilometre-wide asteroid. The probe then left Vesta in 2012, bound for Ceres. 
Dawn achieved series orbit insertion in March 2015, in the process becoming the first NASA spacecraft to orbit two different worlds. This is Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary. A mission to examine the habitability of Jupiter's ice moon Europa has taken one step closer to the launch pad with the completion of a major NASA review. NASA's Europa multiple flyby mission spacecraft would launch during the 2020s, arriving at the Jovian system several years later. The probe would orbit Jupiter every two weeks, providing numerous opportunities for close flybys of the ice moon Europa. The mission plan calls for between 40 and 45 flybys during the prime mission, during which the spacecraft will image the Moon's icy surface in high resolution and investigate its composition and the structure of its frozen shell and interior. The frozen Jovian world of Europa is the smallest of the four Galilean moons discovered by the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei in 1610. Europa is slightly smaller than Earth's moon. It has the smoothest surface of any known object in the solar system, and that means it has an extremely young surface. The smoothness of Europa's surface led to the hypothesis that a global subsurface liquid water ocean exists beneath Europa's 100 km thick ice sheets. Scientists think heat generated by tidal flexing as Europa orbits Jupiter is what's causing the subsurface ocean to remain liquid. It's thought the same process also drives ice movement on the surface, similar to the mantle convection causing plate tectonics here on Earth. The movement of Europa's ice sheets could also be acting to transport chemicals from the surface down into the ocean below. Water vapour plumes, similar to those found on the South Pole tiger stripes of the Saturnian ice moon Enceladus, have also been detected on Europa. These are likely to be caused by erupting cryogeysers. It's not known if there's any hydrothermal activity on the ocean floors of Europa. However, such locations on Earth have provided a rich chemical soup teeming with life, and they're thought to be a possible candidate for where life on Earth began. Therefore, similar environments on Europa raise the possibility, and dare we say hope, of a similar outcome. With the Europa flyby project successfully completing its key decision point B review, the project now moves forward into its preliminary design phase. A highlight of the Phase A portion of the project was the selection and accommodation of the 10 scientific instruments being developed to study the mysteries of Europa. The new mission phase is planned to continue through September 2018 and should result in the completion of preliminary design of the mission systems and subsystems. Some testing of spacecraft components, including solar cells and scientific instrument detectors, has already been underway during Phase A, and this work will continue during Phase B. It's also during Phase B when spacecraft sub-assemblies are built and tested. The life cycle of a NASA science mission includes several key phases. Missions must successfully demonstrate that they've met all the agency's requirements in order to indicate their readiness to move forward to the next phase. Phase B also includes preliminary design work, while Phases C and D will include final design, spacecraft fabrication, assembly and testing, and the launch. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Okay, time to take a quick break from the show and talk about one of our sponsors. Yeah, there are many times when you can't hold a book, but you can listen to one, such as when you're commuting, when you're at the gym, jogging, or walking the dog. And that's when I listen to Audible. It's my audio bookstore. And you know, I love the idea of someone reading to me. And no one offers a greater selection than Audible. In fact, they've got something like 180,000 titles plus to choose from. Audible's great if, like me, you have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Audible means you can learn so much. And right now, Audible has a special deal for space-time listeners. Audible's offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. And they've got so many great books to choose from. All the bestsellers, the classic science fiction, science fact, history, biography, whatever, often from the people who actually wrote them. How about Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen, narrated by Bruce Springsteen? Or The Life of Keith Richards, narrated by Johnny Depp, Joe Hurley, and Keith Richards himself. No matter what your taste, there are over 180,000 titles to choose from. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime. That's audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime for your free audiobook. Or just click on the link at spacetimewithstuartgary.com. And now, back to our show.
Back in April last year, Russian physicist and billionaire Yuri Milner, together with British scientist Stephen Hawking, announced plans for the Breakthrough Starshot initiative. The project aims to fly a swarm of tiny spacecraft to the Alpha Centauri star system, 4.37 light-years away, and possibly more importantly, do it all within our lifetimes. Milner plans to invest some $100 million in the development of an ultra-lightweight light sail that can be accelerated to something like 20% the speed of light, fast enough to reach Alpha Centauri in around 20 years. Using today's most powerful chemical engines, a spacecraft will take about 30,000 years to get there. Alpha Centauri is a triple star system containing two stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, which orbit each other and which in turn are orbited by a third star, Proxima Centauri, at a distance of 0.22 light years away from the binary stars. That's about 12,500 times more distant than the Earth is from the Sun. Alpha Centauri A is a spectral type G yellow dwarf star, just a little bit bigger than our Sun. Its binary partner, Alpha Centauri b, is a spectral type K orange dwarf star, slightly smaller and cooler than the Sun. Proxima Centauri is a small, cool spectral type M red dwarf star, just an eighth the Sun's mass and a seventh of its diameter. Proxima Centauri is located about 4.25 light years away, making it the nearest star to the Sun. You may recall that Proxima Centauri caused quite a sensation in August 2016, when astronomers from the European Southern Observatory discovered an Earth-sized planet orbiting the star in its habitable zone, the region around a star where temperatures would allow liquid water, essential for life as we know it, to exist on a planet's surface. Milner's plan involves building a swarm of tiny insect-sized spacecraft weighing less than 100 grams each and then mounting each of them on a giant 100,000 square metre light sail, equivalent to the size of 14 football fields. The sails will be manufactured out of graphene, an extremely thin and light but mega-tough carbon film. The film would then have to be blanketed in a highly reflective cover in order to endure the harsh conditions of deep space and also the heat near the destination star. The silicon chip-sized probe's optical and electronic systems would have to be tiny. But when you think about it, if you remove all the unnecessary components from a smartphone, there are only a few grams of functional technology which would remain. So, technologically speaking, it's all possible. These lightweight spacecraft would need to be able to navigate independently and transmit their data back to Earth by laser. To do so would need energy, which could be harnessed from the stellar radiation. The light sails would be propelled across the cosmos by photon pressure, just like wind powers sails on a yacht. The photons would originate both from the solar wind emanating from the sun and also from specially built laser cannons on Earth, accelerating the tiny probes on their way. The probes should be able to accelerate within 20% the speed of light, which is about 300,000 km per second in a vacuum. That would allow the probes to reach the Alpha Centauri system within two decades. However, it does raise one very important question. When you get there, how do you actually stop a spacecraft from travelling at almost superluminal speeds? The problem of how to slow down and stop the projectile once it reaches its target remains a challenge. You see, a probe travelling this fast would cover the distance between the Earth and the Moon in just six seconds. Right now, our very best spacecraft takes some 19 hours to cover that distance. So therefore, without some way of stopping, the Breakthrough Starshot spacecraft would simply hurtle through the stars and planets of the Alpha Centauri system in a flash. Not much time for some good science. But now scientists with the Max Planck Institute in Germany have come up with a possible solution. They plan to simply reconfigure the light sails on the probes as they get closer to the Alpha Centauri system and then use the stellar winds and gravity of Alpha Centauri to simply decelerate the spacecraft. So as the spacecraft got closer to Alpha Centauri, the braking force would correspondingly increase. And the stronger the braking force, the more effectively the spacecraft's speed can be reduced upon arrival. The spacecraft could then manoeuvre and navigate themselves to their ultimate target, the Earth-sized planet Proxima b. The tiny spacecraft would first need to approach the star Alpha Centauri a, coming to just 4 million kilometres from the star, corresponding to about 5 star radii and a maximum speed of 13,800 kilometres per second, which equates to around 4.6% of the speed of light. Any faster than that and the probes would simply overshoot the star. During the encounter, the probes would not only be repelled by the stellar radiation coming from Alpha Centauri A, but they'd also be attracted by the star's gravitational field. And it's this effect which can be used to deflect the probes around the star. It's known as a gravity assist slingshot manoeuvre, and it's commonly performed to accelerate and manoeuvre spacecraft around our solar system. 
On the downside, it would increase the overall travel time from 20 to around 100 years. That's about twice as long as what the Voyager spacecraft have now been flying for. Theoretically, the autonomous active light sail proposed for the mission would transport the probes into bound orbits around Alpha Centauri A, allowing them to explore any planets in the system. The light sails could also be configured so that the stellar pressure from Alpha Centauri A breaks and deflects the probes towards Alpha Centauri B, where they'd arrive just a few days later. The probes could then be slowed again and catapulted towards Proxima Centauri, arriving there about 46 years later. Trouble is, that would be some 140 years after leaving Earth. And of course that poses a problem because the Breakthrough Starshot initiative is designed to work on timescales of decades, allowing results to be realised in a single generation. What it all means is that while the Max Planck proposal would work, it would only be our grandkids that would get the science. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Getting to Proxima Centauri is one thing. Getting there with sails is another. Looks like this is uh, all going to maybe come together really beautifully. Maybe it will, Andrew. It's part of Yuri Milner's Breakthrough Starshot project, which is one of the three elements of the Breakthrough program. Breakthrough Starshot aims to send a small spacecraft, and by small I mean one weighing a few grams, not kilograms, grams, to Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star to the Sun. Distance is about 4.2 light years. That is a distance that really translates into something like 40 odd trillion kilometers. And it means that with the technology we have available today, the typical journey time would be about 100,000 years. But the Breakthrough Starshot project aims to do much better than that by equipping one of these nano spacecraft with a solar sail, a, a huge sheet of thin material like mylar or something like that, and then to blast it on with nothing more than radiation. So it sails along on the radiation from the sun, but when the sun is so far behind that its light has died down, then you blast lasers at it, mm. boost it along with your own lasers. So that project we've been talking about now for well over a year, and people are certainly working on it. It has always been assumed, though, that since you'll reach to get there with this technology, the idea is you'll reach a speed of something like a third of the speed of light. That means it shrinks the journey times to something like 30 years rather than 100,000 years. But it means that when you get to the other end, you just zoom past at a third of the speed of light and you only get the merest blink of what this probable planet around Proxima Centauri looks like. Oh, see, I never thought of that. I never thought about not being able to stop. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. No, you can't stop because there's oh, nothing to stop you. Right. Except that a very, very smart scientist, which is what the best scientists are, they're pretty smart. <laughs> this is somebody who's at the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in Germany. Um, he has figured out that you can actually use the radiation of Alpha Centauri itself to slow down the spacecraft when it gets to the other end. Oh, okay. Maybe. Yeah, maybe that, even, yeah, that makes perfect orbit. sense. So when you yeah. get there, you do the reverse, basically. You do. That's right. You sort of you do some the sort of things that sailors have been doing for centuries. You turn the sail facing the other way, and uh, it starts slowing down because of the radiation of Alpha Centauri. What it does is extends the journey time because you're suddenly decelerating. Hmm. But they also suggest that you can use use a, what we call a gravitational assist. It's when you fly by usually a planet, actually, to pick up some gravity from that. You can do the same thing in reverse by doing a gravity assist from Alpha Centauri itself and actually losing energy so that you slow down and hopefully get within Cui of Proxima Centauri and maybe see Proxima Centauri B, which is the planet that we believe is orbiting around Proxima Centauri. One reason, as a footnote to this, Andrew, one reason why everybody's so excited about this project is that Proxima Centauri B, the planet of Proxima Centauri, is thought to be an Earth-like planet. It's in the Goldilocks zone of its parent star, ah. and it's about the same t size as the Earth. Wow. So, But we don't know much more about it than that, except that's that about, it, that's it, about it. it's a rocky planet. So we don't know if it's got water. We don't know if it's got... Yeah. And I mean, we don't absolutely have any idea whether or not there's there's vegetation on it because we don't know of life beyond 
birth, basically. That's, that's correct. Mm. Absolutely right. So this is a pretty impressive project, and it's shaping up to be something that might, you know, in 30 years' time, be taking us to the nearest star. I just hope I last long enough to see it. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, but there's, you know, as you and I have discussed, there's a possibility that we will perhaps find some kind of microbial life within our own solar system because we're starting to find water in all sorts of places. Indeed, that's right. So there are, I think, now six worlds that are known to have this structure of a rocky core, an ocean overlying the core, and then ice overlying the ocean. Um, they're all moons of other planets, and any one of those actually is also worth a spacecraft. But of course, you've got the problem of trying to drill through 20 kilometers of ice to find out what's in the ocean. But they're all candidate worlds for finding life. Mm. And of course, the star performer is still the planet Mars. I still am rather hopeful that we'll get some results within the next decade or so that will prove conclusively that there is life on Mars. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? Yeah. I think it would. Yeah. That would be a yeah. red letter day indeed. So back to Proxima Centauri, when when are they expecting to launch this micro spacecraft? I don't even think there is a date on the horizon. I think it's very much in the level of trying to develop the technology and basically try and see just how realistic this might be. We have a very wealthy entrepreneur heading this project and basically supporting it. I think there's a good chance that if he saw that this was a goer, he would pour more money into it and bring it forward. So it might well be, you know, not in too many years' time. Yeah. And I, I, I would think that uh, sending a micro spacecraft across you know a section of the cosmos would be a lot easier than a mega spacecraft it may well be i suppose your biggest problem is the risk of losing it yeah um, you know because this thing's got fairly small radio antenna and uh, it's all very lightweight if you lose it in space then that's a bit embarrassing and things that only weigh grams would be very easily lost in space and, so, and, and yet you've got civilians doing today what nasa could only do 30 yeah, 40 years right. ago so yeah. you know yeah, it stands indeed. to reason that this is is going to happen. I think it will happen too. Yeah. Mm. I think it's a great project. Oh, I love it. I think it's just got everything about space travel and 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 um, looking beyond our own solar system just all wrapped up into a really exciting little uh, package. I think it's going to be fantastic. Absolutely. And hopefully we're still around to see it. Um, Absolutely. Amen to that as well. That's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dackley on our sister program Space Nuts. And this is Space Time with me, Stuart Gary. The first Ariane 5 launch for 2017 has successfully blasted into orbit carrying two new telecommunications satellites. Ariane Space Flight VA-235 launched from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana into cloudy grey skies. The cryogenic liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled core stage main Vulcan 2 engine and its twin strap-on solid rocket boosters powered the giant 55-metre tall stack off its South American launch pad. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, so right on schedule at 18.39 local, Ariane 5 beginning her mission, lifting off perfectly and beautifully from the ground here in French Guiana with a lot of fire streaking through the clouds as the DDO says all is well on board, beginning her mission, the second for Ariane space this year with two new telecom satellites for major regional operators. The two boosters are now providing 90, that's 90% of the thrust, propelling the launcher along her trajectory at an ever higher velocity. 775 tons is our mass at liftoff. She's burning five tons of fuel per second, 2.5 tons in each booster burning per second, and the core stage burning another 300 kilos every second. Ariane 5 is now following the program and the onboard computer, which gives all the orders, including stage separations. We're in the first of four flight phases as she heads east across the Atlantic. Right now, the first flight phase, the single Vulcan core stage engine and the two boosters burning together. The boosters will burn their 240 tons in just over two minutes, and they're the first to be extinguished. You'll hear the DDO call out that milestone in about 20 seconds. 
We are 15 kilometers from the pad here, but even here you can feel the sensation of liftoff. If you're watching from the closest viewing station, less than four, five kilometers from the pad, you can really hear the noise and see the light. Video confirms it, two orange points of light falling away on either side, and the white light in the middle, that's the core stage, burning. The boosters fall 500 kilometers from shore La in a protected area. Nominal. The strap-on SRBs burnt out and were jettisoned just two minutes after launch, while the core stage continued firing for another seven minutes. Miko, main engine cutoff and stage separation, occurred nine minutes after launch, with the upper stage then igniting its HM7B liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen cryogenic engine for what would be a 16-minute burn to deliver the two satellites into their geostationary transfer orbits. The 6,000kg Sky Brazil 1 was the first to be released about 27 minutes after launch. Operated by AT&T DirecTV, Sky Brazil 1 will provide high-definition television across Brazil. The satellite carries enough fuel for a design life of 19 years. 12 minutes later, the 3,550kg Telcom 3S was released into its geostationary transfer orbit. The Indonesian satellite will provide the archipelago nation, as well as Malaysia and parts of Southeast Asia, with high-definition television, mobile communications and internet services. The satellite carries enough fuel for a 16-year lifespan. This flight was the 91st Ariane 5 mission and the second Ariane space flight for the year. The next Ariane space flight will be a Vega rocket carrying the Sentinel-2B Earth observation satellite into orbit. At this stage, it's slated for launch on March the 6th. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from Spacetime with StuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe.